want to talk to you about salmon. Salmon is one of my favorite fish. I really like to eat it. They actually served it this morning for breakfast at my hotel because uh, beautiful enough as it is, uh, Greeks love the same food that I do. Thank you very much for that. But my appreciation for salmon goes a little bit deeper. One of the most iconic phenomena in the North Atlantic is the salmon run. Now the salmon run is a time every year when salmon decide to swim upstream against the current back to the river where they were born. Now imagine that. Salmon swim hundreds of miles against very powerful currents. I'm talking rushing water, waterfalls. They defy bears, fishermen, and other predatory animals. They go against nature, and they go against all odds, even to the extent that they defy waterfalls themselves. They leap and they bound to get to their destination, to get to their essence. They know it by the smell, where they came from, what their core is. And as you can imagine, it takes incredible effort. It's very exhausting to the point where sometimes they even stop eating. And many times, a lot of them don't even survive. But that's the thing. Even in the face of carnal fear, they still defy it to go back to their essence. As a Muslim woman, I feel like I've been swimming upstream my whole life. I was indoctrinated into a world of war from a very early age. 9-11 happened when I was nine years old. I lived through my formative years under a complete assault on my identity. I endured the height of Islamophobia in modern history. By the time I was 10, we had entered Afghanistan. By the time I was 11, we entered Iraq. And this was all I knew. This overwhelm overwhelming current of adversity. It weighed on my shoulders. It was a lot of pressure, enough to knock me out on my back. And it was all I could feel growing up. Now, like with many things, when we're faced with this type of, adver of adversity, these types of currents, we have a decision to make. We can either go with the flow or we can choose to actively defy it instead. One of my earliest notable experiences with adversity was when I was 13 years old. And it was the year that I started wearing a headscarf. So I was really observing this crazy dichotomy between the way I was being treated before I started wearing it and then after I started publicly identifying myself as Muslim, before anyone even knew my name. This one day, my mom picked me up from school, and we were driving. She was in the driver's seat, I was in the passenger seat, and she got pulled over. Now, just like me, my mother is a feminist too, and she chooses not to wear a headscarf. I'm the only one in my family who does. So my mother was in the middle of a conversation with the officer, regular, run of the mill, and then he took a moment to stop, look into the passenger seat, and see me sitting there in my scarf. And he turned back to my mother and asked, do you people speak English? 
Now, all I knew was that I could feel the adversity at the time, though I might not have necessarily identified what it was that I was going through. At 13 years old, I'm sure that my response to this officer was something like, Psh, yeah, I can speak English better than you. But really, what I was enduring was this sense of a current burdening my shoulders. And it was that early that I could sense how this type of adversity could impact our day-to-day -day experience, our day-to-day -day lives. Now, something as simple as a traffic violation, this is actually one of the most mildest responses for a Muslim American these days. Because almost exactly one year ago, there were three Muslim students in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, two of whom were Muslim women who wore headscarves too. They got into a parking dispute with their neighbor and their neighbor entered their home and put a bullet in, ev in each one of their heads, shot execution style, over what the media said was just a parking dispute. Now, how is something like this possible? One of the ways that we misrepresent Muslim women is by limiting their experiences. Now, we can see this happening on a larger scale during the Afghanistan war. It really skews the way that we view people. It dehumanizes them. During the Afghanistan war, this misrepresentation of Muslim women was instrumental. In 2001, Laura Bush made an iconic speech. And in this speech, she said that one of the ways we civilize people throughout the world are speaking out in horror. We do so because we are not only feeling our hearts break for the women and children in Afghanistan, but also because in Afghanistan, we see the world the terrorists would like to impose on the rest of us. Now, we know the iconic professor Edward Said mentioned something like this to us. It's called Orientalism. It's when we look at what we see as Oriental cultures and we view them as being stuck in time as something backwards, something that needs to be entered and changed. We take only a few components of another culture and use those components to define our understanding of the culture as a whole. Now, to give you an example of Orientalism as, uh, at its, uh, as it works is uh, my ask of all of you today to whip out your cell phones because you know we're all young people we're all millennials I know you're dying to check your text messages I'll give you a couple of seconds please take out your phones and do this exercise with me now I want all of you to unlock your phones and open the web browser of your choice. Chrome, Safari, whatever it may be. And I want you to go on images.google.com. Now, in the Google image search, I would like you to type in Muslim women and hit enter. Now, if your screen looks anything like mine, it's pretty bleak. I'm sure that you can scroll for several moments and you see the same depiction of a Muslim woman, faceless, dark, hidden behind black. If we wanted to limit our understanding of another people, then mission accomplished. 
This has been the established image of Muslim women for at least the past decade. It's one dimensional, it's a caricature. It shows that they're an other, that they're different. This is the current. And I'm sure you can see it in the midst of this current, maybe a couple of faces, colorful headscarves, we'll call those the salmon, defying the representation, right? The thing is, we know how the nature of currents is. We know how currents work. The more they pick up, the more the current builds, the more the momentum builds, the more the force behind it builds, and the more dangerous and uncontrollable they become. Now, on a much larger scale, the same phenomenon applies. Recently, I was invited to give a talk to a high school class of honor students, history students. And I was asked to give a talk about racism. So, of course, I look to one of the most tragic exertions of racism in human history. I decided to take a piece of literature, a piece of propaganda, and hand it to these students and ask them, what time period is this from? This is what I gave them. The piece of propaganda said, Jews are not supposed to engage in any form of witchcraft, but a lot do because they're hungry for power. Sometimes Jews in difficulty who see no solution turn to other spiritual remedies but they have no powers or guarantee over darkness or demons. Sometimes these Jews turn to sorcery and give themselves over to demonic possession in order to seek revenge for bitter hurts in their own lives. Now, these students obviously, as soon as they were done reading this, shot up their hands and they said, of course this is from the Holocaust. This is from World War II, Nazi Germany. Some of them even said this could be from the Salem witch trials in the United States. Others said it could be from the time of McCarthyism, when we hunted down communists in our country and penalized them. Now, what I revealed to the students at this point was the real excerpt in its original form, which was actually from a book published in 2014. This was the excerpt. It said, Muslims are not supposed to engage in any form of witchcraft, but a lot do because they're hungry for power. Sometimes Muslims in difficulty who see no solution turn to other spiritual remedies, but they have no powers or guarantee over darkness or demons. Sometimes these Muslims turn to sorcery and give themselves over to demonic possession in order to seek revenge for bitter hurts in their own lives. This was a book a piece of propaganda that was mailed directly to my home in New Jersey. And when I shared this with the students, two of them raised their hands and said, I received this book to my home too. I asked the students to reflect on this and tell me what they thought. And this was the moment where students were deciding whether to go with the current or defy it. And many of them went with the current. I witnessed them start to rationalize this piece of literature. They started saying, well, it's understandable that it's about Muslims. You know, 9-11 happened. We're in two wars in the Middle East. All the things that are happening here at home, of course it's going to be about Muslims. You know, it's, it's, I get it. I understand why. Now imagine that. The problem is that many of these students didn't recognize where in the current they stood. They didn't recognize that they were right in the middle of it. I want everyone in this room to think about what you've been hearing on the news today. Think about the headlines coming out of my country, coming out of your country, the rhetoric that's being used when we speak about certain types of people, the way people are reacting to that type of rhetoric. And I want you to ask yourselves, in this current, where do you stand? 
Are you going with the flow? Are you defying it? Or do you think you're standing still? Because let me tell you that standing still is not an option. Standing still will get you swept right up too. And it's either we get swept up with the current or we make like salmon and we use every ounce of strength in our being to defy it. Now, there are many ways that we can learn to swim upstream and it's important for us to do so now more than ever. Sometimes it's as simple as speaking up when someone is saying something hateful. We as young people have a lot of ways to do that right at our fingertips. Look at the hashtag conversations. Think about the hashtag you ain't no Muslim bro that came out of London when British youth stood beside their Muslim peers and proclaimed that terrorist attacks are not part of Islam. What about in Australia with the hashtag I'll ride with you? When Australians recognized that Muslims felt unsafe in public and they wanted to ride with them too and protect them. What if we are in the unfortunate position of witnessing a hate crime or an attack right in our midst? Are we going to defy the current? Are we going to say something? Are we going to stand up for that person and put a stop to it? The thing is, when we do these actions, when we defy the current, we're not just doing so to the person that we're addressing, but we're also causing a ripple effect to everyone around us. This can change the world. We need to do our research. We need to defy the current by being able to discern the news from reality, from human beings. We need to teach ourselves to learn more. And again, in the age of information, there has never been a more greater time for us to do so. We need to feed off of this education, especially when it comes to people that are different from us and people we don't understand. And then when we do that, we need to continue the ripple outwards by teaching others, teaching those around us. And when we keep doing that, it can start with a couple of ripples, then it can turn into a wave, and then eventually we could change the direction of the current itself. Salmon defy all odds. They swim against the current to reach sustenance. They endure all of this, they endure the fear, in order to provide for themselves and go back to where they were born, no matter what's in their way. For us, we are obligated to go against the current in order to reach our innate subconscious return to our humanity. Thank you.